was going to add some questions. I think we've got questions. I just want to show them some, uh, this is a great space to show them some art. course that is anonymous and goes to the administration. Um, 
so you get to do some evaluating as well. And I think that's it, right? <laughs> <laughs> And everybody has sent me a script mm -hmm. with your citations yes. in it, please. Oh, Citation two separate it. ones. Yeah, me too. That's fine. But technically, um, which one thing I didn't emphasize was in your PowerPoints, if you have stats, you, you should have put some reference to them. Yeah. Just for the future okay. in life. Because, you know, citation matters. Okay. All right. Are we ready? Mm -hmm. I can just go. Okay, so oh, let me just say, listen, scripts and PowerPoints. I need both. Okay. Oh. Sorry about that. That was mine. That's my bad. Okay. Okay, so we challenge whether America is truly the land of the free when its current prison population is 2.3 million people. Because this number is constantly increasing, we refer to it as the larger issue at hand, mass incarceration. To give you a more global perspective, here's a statistic. Although the US is 5% of the world's population, it currently holds 25% of our prison population. Now we ask you all to close your eyes for a question. Raise your hand if you knew that there are currently more black men under carceral control than there were enslaved in 1850. Now open your eyes. No doubt that our population has grown since 1850, but this is about the physical mass of bodies. Close your eyes again. Think about this physical mass. Could you picture them all in one room? All 1.68 million of them? Probably not. What if, they lined, what if they lined up one by one? How many miles would they stretch for? Black prisoners are seemingly invisible because we as a culture fail to recognize these three things. The image of crime in America, two, the business of mass incarceration, and three, the vulnerability of the black community. Now this isn't your normal call to action. We can't expect you to invest yourselves in ACT if you don't know the issue. So we're starting there with the education. Think of this as your training session to get you just ready to tackle the issue and spread the word. So the question is, how and why have these prisoners been invisible for so long? And how did black people, a minority in America, become the majority in prison? We're about to break this down for you, starting with the image of black criminality in America. We see an overrepresented number of black men paraded across our TV screens and into cells with little to no background about the whys and hows. But the truth is, our media has taken a vulnerable population of people and exploited their image with this, which has now become this. And by the way, we see more of this than this. To paint a fuller picture, we have to take you back to the beginning of mass incarceration, slavery. The 13th Amendment ultimately abolished slavery in, in 1865, but this created some incentive to somehow replace the systematic oppression. In other words, loopholes. Everyone is, all Americans are free, except if they're imprisoned. This made Americans champion the imprisonment of black men. This is the foundation of mass incarceration. Although these pictures are 151 years apart, they mimic each other. What's the commonality? Black men in chains. They, this, they have been described as wild, animalistic, and aggressive, which has 
brought on the greatest tragedy of the KKK, Emmett Till, the death of Emmett Till, lynchings, and the arrest of innocent black men. This violence stood from a fear of black men of the 20th century with terms like super predator and thug, which ultimately meant black. It became nearly impossible to run for any political position if you were not tough on crime. So now we're brought on to a new area, era called the tough on crime era. And with this era brought on a series of laws implementing longer sentencing. The first being the Anti-Drug Abuse Act of 1986. This law, this law put more people or this law put more black men in prison for crack cocaine than white people in prison for powder cocaine. So what's the difference between these two drugs? The Atlantic crack cocaine was a, was a drug for gangs. It was an inner city drug, a street corner drug for gangs and guns, while white America experienced it at a distance. Powder cocaine, the more expensive version of the drug, found its way to more affluent users. So, if crack cocaine was predominantly used was predominantly used by black people, why would our government implement a law that predominantly put black people in prison for longer? David Lundgren, a representative who wrote this bill, said that they didn't really have an evidentiary basis for it. Considering the fact that this act created such a large disparity in the white and black prison population, it's pretty unfortunate that our legislation couldn't have come up with more of an evidentiary basis. But again, this was just one law in the series of laws implemented to create longer sentencing, like the three strike rule, truth in sentencing, and the federal crime bill of 1996. The three strike rule meant that three felonies was a life of imprisonment. The truth in, the truth in sentencing law meant eliminated parole entirely. The federal crime bill of 1996 um, increased law enforcement. So we ask, how does increasing more law enforcement fix the initial issues of violence and drug prevalence in these communities? Bill Clinton later admitted that, I signed a bill that made the problem worse, and I want to admit it. We wound up putting so many people in prison that there wasn't enough money left to educate them, train them for new jobs, and increase the chances when they came out they could live productive lives. So these laws became detrimental to the black community. The larger sentencing mixed with the already hyper-intensive police force in these communities resulted in black people being incarcerated for drug crimes at 10 times the rate of white people. So now that we know that these politicians and more politicians other than Bill Clinton have talked about the problems that these longer sentencing laws have implemented, why has nothing been done about it? Well, that brings us to our next point. This mass incarceration has actually been producing massive amounts of money, and these longer sentencing laws are only contributing to the profit. This is the business of mass incarceration. It's not just any business, it's actually a $70 billion business. To give you a better perspective on this, to be imprisoned in Pennsylvania per year costs about $42,000. And to attend Temple University costs about $10,000 less if you're an in-state resident. So that means a year of top-notch education in our state is less expensive than a year in prison. It's just about who's paying for it and where the money's going. So part of the reason that it's so expensive um, to be in these prisons and why these prisons are expending um, and outsourcing so much money is because of companies that up their prices for their services that they provide to prisons. For example, this is a telephone company, GTL. They make $500 million a year just by charging $1.13 per minute on each phone call, on, for each minute of a phone call. Why do they do this? Because they can, and not a lot of other companies source their services to prisons. So people will pay more money just so they can have their only um, connection to their loved ones in prison. Another company is a food corporation. 
Aramark, sorry, it's hard to pronounce. Um, $145 million is made by this company every year, despite the fact that they've had complaints of food shortage, maggots, and even um, disruptive employees. But the job has to be done, and prisons will continue paying for their service because they need it and they can't function without it. Some popular companies like Victoria's Secret and JCPenney even use inmates to manufacture their products at cheaper rates than union workers normally would. Um, and some companies are even known for doing this, for outsourcing like free labor. But that's another topic that's a little bit more ambiguous. So shows like NCIS or Law and Order kind of give us this picture of prison. Like it's a place that you just go to sort of pay the price of crime. But what they fail to convey is that for the people that are running these prisons, it's a business. Because of the money profited from these prisons, it's not only sustaining prison managers, it's making them wealthy. For example, this man, he is the CEO of one of the largest privatized prison companies in America. His annual salary is $1,433,720. We did some research on him. This is his home in Tennessee. Now, the only reason that this man can live comfortably in a place like this is because of all of the money that he's making off of people living uncomfortably in a place like this. What's even more disturbing about his company, CCA, is it's signed with Alec. Alec is a company that partners politicians and corporate companies and kind of creates a platform for them to come together and work on certain bills. In other words, a lot of people would say that these bills they're working on are really just a chance for corporate companies to lobby for bills that will produce more income for them. So, unfortunately, Alec proposed the Truth in Sentencing Law and the Three Strike Law. And it's not far off to say that the CCA, this privatized um, prisons company, had something to do with it because they needed stronger laws to keep more people in their privatized prisons so that they could continue to benefit from the growing population. So that they could continue to benefit from these bodies. But these people, they're more than just bodies, they're more than just numbers, they're humans and they have families. Now imagine if the $70 billion prison system contributed some of its money to the public education system. We're talking about the vulnerability of the black community here. Currently, 86% of black boys do not read on level in fourth grade, and 53% of black males do not graduate high school. This is because the public schools we observe around some black communities are significantly less funded, which is no secret to the children there. This makes them believe and de devalue themselves. It makes them believe that people are devaluing their education. Also, too, the schools in these neighborhoods also look like a prison. They have metal detectors upon entry, and police officers and dogs circulate in the building. Could you see yourself thriving here? I couldn't. These elements do not create a healthy or encouraging environment for these students. Eight hours in insufficiently funded school, and what do these children come home to? For some, uh, for some, it's healthy and stable families, but for too many, unfortunately, these families are have don't have parents because of the imprisonment of a mother or father. Seven percent of black children. Seven percent of black children have an incarcerated parent, which is about nine times as much as white children who have an incarcerated parent. Parents help children sleep, eat correctly, and develop cognitively. The lack of developmental help that children receive from parents in prison has been proven to do psychological damage. And for these children, what can they turn to? Without proper influence and education, a cycle commences. 
What does the cycle look like? It depends. But some ch children may turn to drugs or act out, which can lead to present again eventually. We often don't think of the personal effects of mass incarceration. When, because when we think of prison, whether it's on TV or real life, we think about the inmates and the crimes they've committed, but not necessarily the inmates themselves. We often forget the mass of people connected to their, the inmates and the effects they have on their families. To give you a better picture of how the issue affects children of prison and prison parents, here is a video. Finally tonight, you're about to meet some little girls whose eyes are filled with stars, no matter that their father-daughter dance is behind the bars. Our Steve Osinsami takes us into a room with a lot of regret, but so many dreams. All of the prisoners at the Richmond City Jail getting ready for their big event admit they made poor choices, especially for their children. I'm definitely feeling as a parent right now, just not being outside of life. Julian Edwards is serving four years for drug distribution. Joey Atkins is awaiting trial for illegal gun possession. And Ron L. Glasgow is serving seven years for selling drugs. My first time I've been a suit, honestly. But they told me that none of it is their daughter's fault. Oh, that's so pretty. At home, I watched eight-year-old Amaya Thomas getting ready too. I get to touch him and I get to hug him and I get to kiss him. All right. The sheriff here says he's reminding these men why they need to stay out of jail by inviting these little girls to the city lockup to come dance with their fathers. They are not hardcore criminals and they can be very good citizens and the best way to make a good citizen is to make good fathers. Dressed up, you forget they're serving hard time until they break down into tears when their daughters come bouncing past the steel doors. The dance only lasted an hour or two, but in this short time, in this small room, these young girls had real moments with their fathers. Seven-year-old Ronatia Glasgow tried to explain. It's so good and um. <laughs> so you love your dad very much, huh? Yeah. You loving this thing, this thing, or this thing? <laughs> when he does time, his daughter does time, and he told us he'll never let that happen to her again. Steve Osanzani, ABC News, Richmond, Virginia. that these children receive from living in a world where one in six black men is incar are incarcerated. The message that they receive from a world where a system has been set up against them because of preconceived notions. A world where prison has become a business. A world where it's hard to find relief or something to look forward to because prison is a reality wherever they go. So here are some things that you can do to help out. Number one, Get rid of your microaggression vocabulary. And this doesn't necessarily mean to overly censor yourself. It just means to kind of not be a jerk. So what I mean by that, don't refer to black men who wear hoods as thugs or super predators or any of the rhetoric that we mentioned earlier. Secondly, don't refer to low income or inner city black communities as crime filled, drug filled, danger zones to just avoid. Realize the system that has been set up against these people. See the existing families there. They're not different than you or me. Second, spend time with kids. It's that simple because it starts with them. They're the future. They have the power to end the cycle with the help of everyone and they have the power to move forward. Um, there's tons of different volunteer programs you can get involved in to spend time with kids in, in schools, in areas with high incarceration rates, or just in areas where kids are dealing with difficult problems at home. Three, make it your problem. So talk to local senators. You can write them letters. There's now even an app that just came out that updates you on bills that your senators are voting for. You can get involved with this. And all the people that are incarcerated 
because they don't have a voice to vote for the representation that they need, we can be their voice and we can help speak for them. Um, another way that you can speak is through art. So for example, our very own Mr. Brown uh, wrote this play about mass incarceration called The Last Jimmy. Rhea's wearing a lovely t-shirt, um, repping that. Also, Kendrick Lamar dedicated his whole Grammy performance to a similar concept. Um, and for our last example of this, we wanted to leave you with this project done by E.J. Brown. He's a photographer that challenges the image of black criminality in America by setting up these um, college graduates in a position where they look like they're having a bug shop. It's very powerful. So we ask that you will consider our suggestions and help to be the voice for mass incarceration because together we can overpower this monetized issue, this monetized industry. Together we can find justice for inmates and the systematic oppression and the school to prison cycle. And together, if we see this mass of people and furthermore help others to see this mass of people, we can create a world's difference. Well done. Comments? Okay. Um, two things. First, it was clear you guys are both passionate about the topic, which I think actually is true about a lot of them. Like, really helps uh, people be interested in the topic because you like, can tell that you care so much. And second of all, I really liked how you use like how those slides, like just the words that were used to describe. I think that was a really powerful way to like, explain. Thanks. I thought the video added like a good contrast as to just like because you guys can tell us like every like the stats and everything were so helpful, but then also just seeing the video definitely added like an mm -hmm. element that like deepened it a lot, like to see people and like to see the effect. It like also drove your point home about like kids. Really good. I also liked the video a lot um, because it was so emotional and it really captivated people. I think. And I also really liked how it wasn't just statistics, it was also a call to action and something that we could relate to our own lives. Mm -hmm. I like how there was like, like um, anecdotal evidence kind of sparks in there as well because it makes really care about the different situations you put forth and like especially like when you showed that guy's house, it really showed that it really connected us to people with different people. Yeah. I thought the structure you guys used was really easy to follow and made focus more on like kind of the evidence you were giving instead of being confused about being poor. Then also like you guys you have these like really powerful like summations of what you had said earlier like later on like I don't remember exactly like which part but you guys kind of like drive it home with like a lot more than just like the statistics like you would kind of put your own like I don't know that was good. Really good. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to say that in the beginning we have we have a slide um, going back. It was showing how black people were 13% of our population and how they're 40% of our prison population. And I had said that they were the majority in prison, but actually it's as a whole minorities are the majority in prison. And I realized that I like oopsed on that. <laughs> so I don't want to put out false information. Um, black people are 40%, and then um, I can actually bring it back up again. I just don't use. Sorry. But I like said it, and then I went back. And then, so just to give you guys a clear picture, this is what we're looking at in terms of this part. I was going to say that I thought the um, coming back to the three main categories, because it was a really big subject. There were a lot of ideas that continually coming back to that frame really helped. It's good. Good job. I, I thought your beginning was really engaging. It was a great way to start it off. I was already interested. Oh, thank you. So we're going to wrap up the citizen if you have it, but I do want to show, um, talk about the last two images, and I know that Max also mentioned the black boy image.
Um, and I wanted to do that one as well. You would have loved to stay if you want, but I'm not giving that away. Well, I wish I had the time. Do you have your books? No, we're sitting up. Go anywhere. If you have them, she had to sell her children for this.